Greetings, and welcome to today's educational program, Managing for Quality Lecture Series number 18, uh, Quality for Our Manifest Destiny, or Quality as Our Manifest Destiny, by Dr. Gregory H. Watson. This is the last of the series, and this is your moderator, Doug Wood, with ASQ's Quality Management Division. So again, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Gregory H. Watson. Please join me in welcoming him. Dr. Watson has degrees in management, law, industrial engineering. He has an, he's an 18-year ASQ fellow and past chair from 2000. In 2020, Dr. Watson was elected as an honorary member of ASQ, its highest honor. Previously, he's received the ASQ Distinguished Service Medal plus the Lancaster, Crosby, and Ishikawa Medals. He's been named an honorary member by 19 other national quality associations. Dr. Watson has been a frequent speaker at ASQ national and divisional conferences. And he's delivered this webinar series for QMD since early 2020. He is a former quality executive for Hewlett Packard, Compact Computer, and Xerox, and he's coached executives in quality transformations at Nokia Mobile Phones, Toshiba, ExxonMobil, and over 20 other companies. Dr. Watson is the only Westerner to be awarded the Deming Medal by the Union of Japanese Scientists and Engineers, the W. Edwards Deming Award for Dissemination and Promotion Overseas in 2009. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregory H. Watson. Greg, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Doug. I'm still wondering after 18, what floor do I get? <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about quality as our manifest destiny. And before we're, Doug and I were chatting about this term manifest destiny, for many people it brings this idea of the taking of land and the expansion of the United States. But that's not really what I have in mind. What I want to do is I want to begin with a question that's important for all of us, and that is, who are we? Where have we come from, and where are we going? These are some of the basic questions of life, and each of us has an obligation to answer this question. What is it that makes our life worth living? I'm reminded of the myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus, which he wrote in 1942, as the Second World War was overcoming France, where he lived. And he was in the process of trying to understand, what are we doing? with life. And he wrote this. He said, to decide whether life is worth living is to answer the fundamental question of philosophy. Everything else is child's play. We must first of all answer the question. Maya Angelou, the poet who just recently passed away, said, you may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. In fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeats so you can know who you are, what you rise from, and how you can still come out of it. This series of questions has gotten uh, us onto a philosophical beginning. And I want to be summarizing, if you will, a little bit of what we've learned about quality in these 18 lectures. So quality is not a political artifact to be changed with the winds of shifting political parties. And the problem with traditional approaches to quality management is that it's so locked into our own historical paradigm that it is unable to embrace the rapidly unfolding future, and therefore it lacks the sense of urgency for change. Management, on the other hand, interprets the reticence of quality professionals to advance or to change as irrelevance or ineptitude, and therefore managers tend to ignore quality principles, methods, and tools in their solution seeking for organizational sustainability in a competitive environment. In 2015, I gave a speech to the International Academy of Quality called Not Our Grand Grandfather's Quality. And in that I said, quality has lost its relevance to management and it never found its relevance for society. Well, what is the meaning of manifest? Well, it's got this meaning that says basically it's something that is easily noticed, readily perceived, clearly evident, simply understood, it's obvious and unmistakable. So a manifest capability is something that is clearly recognized through its explicit signs and actions. We know it from we see it. It will be commonly accepted and interpreted as being true. It's also considered by its protagonists to be certain. It's a certainty, not a probability. So dysfunctions, though, keep a social system from meeting its manifest functional requirements. Robert K. Merton was talking about this concept of paradigms. And he said, paradigms are the exemplar of codified, basic, and often tacit 
are understood assumptions, problem sets, key concepts, logic of procedures, and selectively accumulated knowledge that guide theoretical and empirical inquiry in all scientific fields. It is not enough to be compassionate. You must act with the advice of the Dalai Lama. So it's not about good intentions. Good intentions don't get us anywhere. As Peter Drucker had said, you know, good intentions on Sunday, but you'll still be sinners on Monday. And so we need to figure out what do we mean to be moving forward. And so that comes to the second word, destiny. So destiny is a predetermined course of events. It is a predictable outcome. So is destiny a fate or a prediction? If destiny is our fate, then there's no changing of the outcome. If it's a prediction, then it implies that it has some associated probability, which in turn implies some zero, non-zero opportunities for reversing the outcome. So can we be the masters of our fate? Winston Churchill in 1941 in the Battle of Britain said, we are the masters of our fate. We are the captains of our souls. Together, we shall never cease to persevere. Stephen Covey commented, the quality of our thoughts determine our actions, and our actions develop our habit. Our habit creates character, and our character forges our destiny. So we see these terms are related. So then we bring together as manifest destiny. And this is a cultural belief that a future state is both justified and inevitable. And when we apply this term manifest destiny to a particular culture, race, or nation, the principle then creates a state of exceptionalism that holds rights and privileges over others. So a nation is above others or people are above others. Manifest destiny is not reserved for one tribe or nation. It's a common destiny for all humanity and the earth which supports us. In 1776, Thomas Paine wrote the treatise Common Sense, which actually stimulated a lot of the thinking at the beginning of the foundation of America. And he said, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah until now. The birth of a new world is at hand. Perhaps we can reflect on this idea of rebuilding the world afresh in a new context and design new potentialities for the way our world works and the implication of its operating cycles. As John F. Kennedy said, let us seek the right answer. Let us not seek to fix the blame on the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. So we have the meaning of quality. And in the very first lecture, I was talking about quality, and I defined it as the pursuit of goodness coupled tightly with the relentless avoidance of badness. In a very famous quote you've probably heard from John Ruskin, he wrote this in 1851. He said, quality is never an accident. It's always a result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives the cumulative experience of many masters of craftsmanship. Quality also marks the search for an ideal after necessity has been satisfied and mere usefulness has been achieved. Mark Twain commented, do the right thing. It will gratify some people and astonish the rest. So a good social benefit, a, good, a social good benefits the largest number of people in the best possible way, such as clean air clean water, health care, and literacy. And so to start thinking about this, we have to understand, what is the agenda that humanity needs to pursue to reach its manifest destiny and to gain a sustainable planet biosphere so that we can sustain life in the human race and all other living life on this planet? So we see that we have evolved as a human race over a series of what are called S-curves. First, we had the hunter-gatherer. This was about this basic survival. Then we had control the food, do something useful. Then we started creating energy in the industrial, and now we moved into advanced intelligence, and we're talking about the post-industrial age. So what can we collectively do to create a more thriving universe to benefit all of humanity as we come towards the end of this coming age, or this S-curve that we're now in today? When we take a look at these S-curves, we see that they talk about discontinuity, disruption, and diversity. And these challenges stimulate thinking in different ways. So at the very beginning of the S-curve, at the bottom, 
we see there is a struggle for survival as we go through development. We don't really know what to do or what's happening, and there's a slow start. And this is called the fragility zone. We don't know, will this idea take off? Will this actually be able to develop? And then we, we pass an inflection point, and the curve starts to increase, and we go into this phase called acceleration. Here, the growth emphasis is building towards exponential progress, good results with reasonable effort. And as we get to the point, there's another inflection, and here the curve starts to flatten out or decelerate. And, and here we see that there's an imperative for development because it's increasingly hard to make progress. We have rapidly declining payback. The product or the extension that we're looking at has becoming mature. And at some point in time, it reaches its limit to growth. And we're in now this second fragility zone. And at this point in time, we have to make a decision. How do we move forward? Do we move to another higher level of S-curve with innovation accepted? Or do we have a rejection? of the next innovation, innovation, and we have a rejection, and then we have the decline. So these S-curves are natural patterns of renewable growth and decay. This rhythm can be seen in all kinds of functions, both natural systems and as well in organizations, and the way our products and services actually operate in markets. We take a look at this. We see this is a study that was done by the World Economic Forum about global risks. And what they identified here was the impact versus likelihood. And here are the top 10 risks in this uh, red box that we see. So climate change action failure, or climate action failure, extreme weather conditions, biodiversity loss, natural disasters, water crisis, cyber attacks, human aid, environmental disasters, information infrastructure breakdown, global governance failure, and interstate conflict. So if we take a look, seven of those are about the environment. Two have to deal with information technology, and then the other one is talking about the result in being conflict or war. And uh, uh, Klaus Schwab, who was the founder of the World Economic Forum, says, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. And if we take a look further into this, we start seeing that these risks fall into a number of categories, economic, environmental, geopolitical, social, uh, and, or technological, and all those risks are connected as a system. Mr. Donella Meadows, who wrote Systems Thinking, a fabulous book to introduce you to the idea of thinking and systems, and she said, the world is a complex, interconnected, finite, ecological, social, path, uh, psychological, and economic system. We treat it as if it was not, as if it was divisible, separable, simple, and infinite, are persistent, Intractable global problems arise directly from this mismatch. So when we see everything as a unique, standalone, rational subject that can be investigated and solved on its own, we miss the boat of interconnectivity. We miss the implications about what we could see in the interactions among all of these different factors. So when we talk about how do we adjust our way of thinking, I'm reminded of William Shakespeare. He said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and they have their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. Our roles may be manifest. That means seeking positive results as a function. Or they may be latent, victims of unintended consequences. So latent functions. And the way they could be dysfunctional with a negative effect on society. So Robert K. Merton brought these two ideas out about Manifest destiny and latent destiny or functionality. And we may be limited by rigidity that constrains our core. How we think, uh, think and work is too fixed or released by creative flexibility that enables an adaptive response that's an agile response. And Dorothy Leonard, a psychologist at Harvard, talked about these core rigidities and core flexibilities. Edith Langer talked about how the idea of mindfulness is important. She said, we may be aware of what we're doing, we may be mindful, or we may be ignorant of the phenomena and circumstances around us. That's mindless. And Herbert Simon, in his seminal book, Administrative Behavior, 1947, wrote, the effectiveness of the administrative process, or how we govern ourselves, will vary with the effectiveness of the organization and the effectiveness with its, which its members play their parts. Everyone is playing a part. 
Now, there's two ways we can look at this, and, and we have tend to, to have either an optimistic or a pessimistic bias. And, and Julie Norum is another Harvard psychologist, and she's talked about defensive pessimism and strategic optimism. And this means we, we can have an optimistic bias or a pessimistic bias. So an optimistic bias is, happens when we believe it won't happen to me, but it probably will. So defensive pessimism is a strategy that people who are anxious and, and they don't really know how well they're going to do. So they have unrealistic low expectations about what they'll perform. And then they devote all their energy to playing through, reflecting on all the potential outcomes that they can imagine for the situation so they don't advance for fast. So, so these defensive pessimists do the best when they critically examine negative outputs when planning the future and they avoid relaxing about it because then they will have this avoidance process and keep badness from happening. On the other hand, strategic optimist is a strategy whereby people set optimistic expectations for their performance and they avoid any extensive reflection and that masks the negative information that would uh, avoid them using these self-serving optimistic illusions. So strategic optimist works best if they avoid reflecting on potential and press forward in a relaxed state. And Julian Oram said, what disrupts one group enhances the other group. Positive mood impairs the defensive pessimist, while a negative mood impairs the strategic optimist. So as humans, we make choices, and we often flavor those directions of our choices by the mindset that we take and the attitude we have. And when we look at society as a whole, we start seeing that society requires some coordinated functions. And these coordinated functions are the social infrastructure or the infrastructure of the social system. And infrastructure enables equitable distribution of resources to advance for the common good. And we see many categories, transportation, power and energy, agriculture and water, waste management, communications, social, and security. And all of those have many subsets that you could go into. But this is what holds, if you will, this human social system together. And Rahul Gandhi, a rising tide doesn't raise people who don't have a boat. So there's often the economist saying a rise, rising tide raises all the people. When the economy goes up, everybody goes up. But he says, if you don't have a boat, you're not going to get, you're going to drown. So we have to build a boat for them. We have to give them the basic infrastructure to rise with the tide. And so we start seeing that managing global resource for the greatest good is part of what the difficulty is. So Donella Meadows made the comment, the scarcest resource is not oil, metals, clear air, capital, labor, or technology. It is our willingness to listen to each other and learn from each other and to seek the truth rather than seeking to be right. John Ruskin, returning to another quotation from his book, he says, when we build, let it not be for the present delights nor for the present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for, and let us think that a time is to come when these stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them, and that men will say as they look upon the labor and the wrought substance of them, see this our fathers did for us, I would say, and our mothers too. Human energy and intellect are the greatest renewable resources on this earth, and the greatest waste of all kinds is a waste of human intellect and developmental potential. Haru Ishikawa, towards the end of his life, gave a benediction for quality. And this quality development innovates to avoid Gucci's loss to society. And this was Ishikawa's hope and prayer of quality for humanity, that quality and related activities be spread everywhere in the world, that quality all over the world be improved, that cost be lowered, that productivity be increased, that raw material and energy be saved, that people all over the world be happy, and that world prosper and be peaceful. This means inclusive action results in good quality of life for society. So quality for humanity is the global social imperative. Donella Meadows said, the revolution will be organic. It will arise from the visions, insights, experiments, and actions of billions of people. Everyone can contribute. It's like the total and total quality management. Now, if we take a look at part two, we want to learn how the global quality community must engage society to accelerate achievement of Earth's manifest destiny. 
So I, I going back to a, a comment that Walter Schwart made in his statistical methods uh, from the viewpoint of quality control. He said, hindsight supplements foresight. A view backward often aids materially to a view forward. And we see that what we're talking about is the current anchor we have into the dynamic state, how life is changing. It has historical performance, and that's the insight we get from variation. That's hindsight. It's old data. And then we have to have psychological insight. That's situational awareness and sense making to understand and interpret what are we seeing today. And we bring those two together to create a predictive foresight, which is a probabilistic future scenario. As I mentioned, we're living in this Bayesian moment. It's a conditional probability as we pass from the past that has happened to the future that could happen. And this is where we live, work, and choose. So we have sort of five choices for responding to crisis. Danella Meadows made this comment. There are no separate systems. The world is a continuum. Where we draw a boundary on a system depends on the purpose of the discussion. And so for every discussion we have, it's going to be a different system. So we have five options. Do nothing, maintain control, create robustness, bounce back, or adaptively adjust. Now, Socrates said the secret of life is uh, a secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building new. So don't work on resisting, work on creating and innovating. So let's review these five different strategies. First, we see do nothing, the deer in the headlights. It's reactive. This syndrome fails to recognize that the situation requires action and rejects the challenge to change when faced with a situation. It's a negligent response. We cannot become what we want by remaining what we are, Max Dupree. The second choice is maintain control. This is reactive. This is the stick your head in syndrome, uh, in the sand ostrich syndrome, and avoids making any clear commitment like the ostrich and fails to cope with the situation around it. This is a situational response, and it basically ignores reality. So sometimes the things we can't change end up changing us because we don't see them coming. The third choice is to create robustness, be reactive again. And here we retreat into our protective shell mechanism just like the turtle. And so that the burdens may come from the outside, but we are protected because our shell is so thick, it will not hurt us. This is a robust response. So we create robustness so the noise from outside will not destroy the conditions on which we have achieved stability. Management often goes on a retreat to consider its strategy. I've always thought it should go on and advance instead. Because retreat means to give up and to go backwards. And advance means to take a look at where you are and to move forward. Fourth choice is to bounce back. And I have two little gifts here. The first is about collaborative teamwork. And what we see is a, a large worm that's being attacked by all the white blood cells coming in to attack it. And we can see that it's destroying it by their collaborative teamwork. And this is how nature affects things. On the other hand, if we take a look on the second here, we see that this is a white blood cell and it's chasing some bacteria in a persistent pursuit. And it finally gets it and surrounds it and brings it inside and now it captures it. And so we see that these response teach us how nature is working. And we can learn by observing how nature operates at a system. This is called resilience. So resilience is the ability to recover quickly from difficulty capacity to bounce back in response to external influence so an organism maintains its capability despite threats imposed from the outside, and ultimately it learns to overcome this influence as a matter of its routine operations. C.S. Lewis says you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. So resilience is also nature's way of working. The fire that destroyed much of this forest was not sufficient to destroy the redwood trees that had burned. They recovered, and the forest bounced back. And this is nature's way. And what we also see is that we have another option, and this is to adaptively adjust. This is proactive. And this is what Nassim Nicholas Taleb called uh, anti-fragility. And it's, it's anti-fragility is beyond resilience or robustness. The resilient resists shocks and stays the same. The anti-fragile takes the shots and gets better. 
And here we can take a look at a molecule here. And this molecule is called myoglobin. It's a three-dimensional structure. And we see that this, this one red dot here, that's the oxygen uh, uh, molecule that's attached there. And this is built to give you extra strength. Now, hemoglobin has four units of oxygen on each red blood cell. That's what we use for distributing uh, food and, and oxygen in the body. And this gives us energy, and, and it keeps us going. And so what we see is that when we are under stress, that the muscles are contracting, that extra piece of oxygen releases to give us more energy. And we have to discover advanced warning signs to find the triggers of change that creep in and attack vulnerabilities at the edge of our ability to control critical assumptions in your operation so you can gain advance notice of them and you can adapt by making real-time responses. This is anti-fragile. And the system increases in survival ability as a result of collected learnings from past mistakes, faults, failures, attacks, shocks. As Kazuko Okura said in the, the Book of Tea, the art of life lies in our constant readjustment to the surroundings. And so anti-fragility is nature's development way. So we see the red blood cells have 80% of the oxygen. However, if we get stressed, like a runner going on a marathon, if you've ever done that, you know there's a time when you go through the wall and you get an extra lift. That's when the myoglobin releases that extra 20% of oxygen, and it gives you this boost of energy. So in life, we need three things to live, food, water, and oxygen. And the role of oxygen is to ignite human energy so that the muscles can perform. Now, let's have a thought experiment. So what would a world be without waste? And I think of this as called Imagineering. It's a new discipline. We're adding innovation to engineering. And it, this is the, the definition of imagination from planet.net. The ability to form an image of something in the mind which has not be, been comprehended by the five senses can be described as imagination. Imagination can also be described as the capability of one's mind to create mental scenes or pictures of events that have not happened or of those that have already happened. So uh, Phil Johnson Laird in Mental Models wrote, the mind constructs mental models as a result of perception, imagination, knowledge, memory, and the comprehension of discourse. Or as Walt Disney said, all your dreams can, can, can come true if you only have the courage to pursue them, because he lived in the world of imagination. So in part three, what I want to talk about is understand how your personal contribution will help to create this vision of reality. So I've talked in the past about the three Gamba organizations. And what I want to do is turn Ishikawa's benediction into blessings for humanity. So achieving results requires participation of all people at all levels. And we see at Gamba 1, we're talking about citizen contributions, taking action by doing little things like cleaning up your neighborhood, planting a tree, educating your plan, uh, family, picking up plastics, using green packaging, you know, properly disposing of waste, stop contributing to the formation of this global mess. At the Gamba 2 level, we're talking about social systems contributions, and here we can implement projects that sustain preservation of natural resources and protect the biosphere. Invest in technologies that will create improved biosphere and human conditions. And apply economic peer pressure to conform to this direction. However, at the governmental level, GAMBA 3, we can take actions to apply social justice and economic policy fairly for all the citizens. We can create biosphere-friendly policy, treaties, laws, and regulations and eliminate subsidies and trade barriers that favor any policy that has a negative impact on our uh, sustainable development objectives. And we need to learn, as it says in the book of Proverbs, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So we see these three levels, and what's actually happening is we have at level one, the citizen contribution, it's about continual improvement. At Gamba level two, the social system is about breakthrough projects. But at Gamble Level 3, the government contribution is really about cultural transformation of the whole world and the nations that live in it. As John Ruskin said, the first duty of government is to see that people have food, fuel, and clothes. The second, they have the means of moral 
an intellectual education. So education is a very part, uh, important enabler of the success of this program for the world. And we see these sustainable development goals, the 17 of them. And they had about 8 million people who were engaged in creating those particular goals. Now, I don't believe that those necessarily are the best goals. But what we mean by this, if we're to do this, we have to create this idea of macro quality. All goodness, no badness for all on planet Earth. So how do we do that? That will not come out of the United Nations, but that can come out of global quality community. So we take a look at the global actions. And global challenges require global actions. And these are basically principles of social engineering for the world. But are they really goals or targets to be achieved? Are they an excellent statement of the grand challenges facing humanity? Or do they sub-optimize and create confusion in priorities for action? Consider this STG 13, climate action, as a case. It was not truly really look at what improves the climate, as there are no true measures that record factors which improve change in physical terms. We use proxy measures that are sub-optimized according to what we can measure. So do these SDGs actually define processes to create the change or the end state? Is the end state climate in action, or is it a balanced biosphere in which we can identify the target, the measures to get there, a set of projects, processes, and procedures which enable attainment of the target, as well as maintenance to hold the gains once reversal of the harmful conditions has been obtained? So the SDGs actually fail to meet even the basic tests for SMART objectives. But Archimedes said, give me a, a fulcrum and a lever long enough and I can move the world. So where is Archimedes' fulcrum for which we can stand and change the world? And how can we find it? So the critique I have is that the UN SDGs overlap in action and confuse in precedence for course of action. We take a look at these 17 SDGs. We see that we have a group of them, eight, that are related to the natural sciences. And these require uh, environmental en uh, engineering. We have another eight that require uh, social engineering, and they relate to the social sciences. And then we see there's an integrated collaborative approach, which is the 17th, partnerships for the goals. So how do we build that collaborative approach? So the objective is to achieve stable balance in this system. So what are the priorities to achieve progress? Which ones come first? Which ones follow? What are the measurable goals to achieve? How do we gain profound knowledge of what's necessary to make that sort of vision of the world come true? So we start seeing that there are evolving systems that are transitioning from local internal to global external influence. So there's a quality imperative. Incrementally increase the scope of content for profound knowledge to understand how the global systems operate and discover opportunities that will change the causal structures that create badness. So Deming gave us a framework of his four elements of this, the uh, system of profound knowledge, but he didn't define them. He doesn't tell us how we go about them or what we do to make those happen. He just gave us the labels and said that should be the truth. In my doctoral dissertation, I created from that a theory of found knowledge by giving them operational definitions and giving them some structure so we understand how they work. But that was localized. That was localized within the microeconomic context of a firm or an organization. And what we need to do is extend the theory of profound knowledge globally. And here we see the complexity of the global system and the need to integrate efforts across a variety of insurmountable boundaries, social, political, disciplinary, technological and emotional, requires this expansion of the theory of profound knowledge to operate in a global systems architecture. And this reminds us that quality sciences are never settled. They must continue to grow to meet the challenges of their age. And we apply this global quality perspective. We see that random local actions do not create systemic results. This means we have to gain this profound knowledge of the system. So all randomized actions do is produce Brownian motion. It's called the random walk model, a random outcome that, that wanders in performance dimensions rather than achieving directional uh, purpose towards a purposeful chain aim. Deming called these types of actions tinkering with the system. Goals must be quantified and related to specific actions. Daily work needs to become standardized, follow an SDCA cycle. Good intentions like the SDG goals 
must become improvement projects in themselves. And improvement projects must be synchronized globally, objectively measured, tracked for success, and, and resource to be effective. This is the PDCA or Jamaic Improvement Project Activity plus the PDSA learning cycle as it observes how all of that system, SDCA, PDCA, Jamaic, is operating together. And we see natural and social sciences must contribute collectively through coordinated actions of nature states to achieve mutual prosperity. Redistribution of resources will be necessary to clean up the mess that has been created over generations of poor management. It's almost impossible to do good without profound knowledge. And all the good intentions of the world are likely to be worthless without profound knowledge. So what should be the principal objective for a strategic global plan that delivers quality for the future generations of humanity? Well, how about environmental security for the biosphere? It's equal important to have security for the world that we occupy as it is to have security for safe neighborhoods and to have economic security for our family. How about purposeful existence for humanity? Humans need to achieve goals to experience purposefulness in life. And that means we need to shift goals from individual to community goals so we can be, uh, that can be obtained by working collaboratively. How about the attainment of peace and true equality for the entire diversity of human race? Karu Ishikawa's comment was, raw materials and energy be safe, all people all over the world be happy and the world prosper and be peaceful. So global prosperity, peace and happiness, leaving nobody behind as we progress. And nobody can do this alone. So creating quality for humanity is a new, if you will, uh, a reality that we are aiming for. And what can be the contribution of the global quality community? Well, there's several. We can work on developing operational definitions for purposeful goals that meet strong criteria for measurement systems. We can guide in establishing sound measurement systems that will integrate the various natural resources and the factors that act as those drivers that are changing the way society operates. We can be a neutral third party to facilitate negotiations and, and which un, upholds a preferred role for scientific investigation to achieve objective evidence that challenges re research hypotheses to develop the newly settled knowledge to gain understanding and hopefully control of those levers of change to enable the ultimate goal in terms of quality of life for all humanity, fulfilling the wish of Kuru Ishikawa. To accomplish this envisioned role, the quality function must be an apolitical force for good unbiased by any extremes, and servant to objective knowledge that can be truthfully demonstrated. As Genichi Taguchi said, quality is the loss function that occurs for society after a product has been developed or delivered. So macro quality must improve the biosphere for the sake of humanity. It deals with change, peoples, things, values, management, critical assumptions, how do we actually deal with all of these ideas and these fears and behaviors that we need to have? Nobody must be left behind. That goal is an important element in the UN SDG. So who are we? Where have we come from? Where are we going? The basic questions of life. As humanity, we must continually renew our identity, history, and direction. It's best that we travel life's path being mindful of our state and purposeful in our action to achieve a common good. What can you do? Study the IAQ point paper, revitalizing the quality, global quality manifesto, and rescope your quality viewpoint from internally focused within organizations to broadly externally focused in the world. Discover the possibility for engaging in actions at the local level that will enable directional change toward achieving quality for humanity at the global level. Commit to engaging and participating in development and follow on deployment of a macro quality action plan to benefit all of humanity. As Joel Barker said, vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision just passes the time. Vision with action can change the world. And so organizational resilience doesn't just happen. As Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And that means macro quality for all of humanity. So takeaway lessons. 
Again, a quote from Donella Meadows in her book, Thinking in Systems. The link here at the bottom is a YouTube video, an hour of her talking about this. Uh, she passed away uh, some years ago, but uh, I think that's an excellent introduction. But she said, hunger, poverty, environmental degradation, economic instability, um, unemployment, chronic disease, drug addiction, and war, for example, persist in spite of the analytic ability and technical brilliance that have been directed towards eradicating them. No one deliberately creates these problems. No one wants them to persist, but they persist nonetheless. That is because they are intrinsically systems problems, undesirable behaviors characteristic of the system structures that produce them. They will yield only as we reclaim our intuition, stop casting blame, see the system as the source of its own problems, and find the courage and wisdom to restructure it. So what does it take to be the change? Quality, enablement, engagement, enthusiasm, and excellence. Enablement, gain the knowledge and skills required to make the change. Engagement, take an active role in driving the required changes. Enthusiasm, keep an open mind and break down barriers to change. Excellence, persist to achieve the world we need for our children. So the learning objectives in this seminar are to discover this agenda, learn how the global quality community must engage society, and understand your personal contribution and how it will help. So remember, improvement begins with I. Also beginning with I is a poem, Invictus, by William Ernst Henley. He wrote in 1875. And I want to tell you a little bit about William Ernst Henley. When he was young, he had um, uh, tuberculosis. And in that age, that was a, a life-threatening disease. He got over this, and he overcame that life-threatening disease. Later, he had another disease attack his leg, and it got gangrene, and they had to cut off his leg. Two years after that, he had another, his other leg, got gangrene in it, and they were going to cut it off. And he decided he was going to go to some doctor in Switzerland from England and find out what it could be done to keep that leg. And he went there. And in the midst of this year-long that he went through, he wrote this poem. And he said, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shag. And yet the menace of the year is finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Invictus means invincible. In my lifetime, I've had one heart attack, four bouts of pneumonia and being in hospitals, twice had cancer. And as I take a look at all of those things, and realize I may not be the person that I was, but I will not let those circumstances be what carries me down. Whatever time I have on life, I want to commit to doing quality. And I hope that each of you, as you've heard these 18 lectures, can understand where I've come from, where I would like us to go, and maybe you found some insight that might help you along the way. That's my prayer for humanity and my wish for all of you. Thank you very much. And here you see my, my LinkedIn site. Uh, I have my new website up. And there's a YouTube channel where I'm going to be putting all of my speeches as well if you want to follow those later on. So thank you very much, Doug. And uh, I think we have some time for questions. Very good. Thank you for uh, what I would consider to be an inspirational talk. Uh, we've had a number of questions already. And I'm going to just kind of start at the top and walk down through them. Um, so um, Orlando had a couple of points. He talked, he said, uh, industry 4.0 seeks quality 4.0 seeks people 4.0. That's a question mark. I and, think so, but I wouldn't want to put a number on it. I would say yeah. 
All innovation needs quality, and all quality needs people. Let me just make one comment about Deming's system of profound knowledge that I've really discovered. They're not four individual elements. What there are is that there, there's basically two different types of categories. And, and what we see is that there's a system category that is systems and variation. And that's how we understand systems through variation. And then there's this other two. One is technology. That's the theory of knowledge. And the theory of knowledge gets embedded in technology over time. And then the other is the human component, which you call psychology. And, and so if we start putting those together, we start seeing we need this systems approach. And that's what's happening with digitalization. That's this industry 4.0. And the challenges we have, how do we cope with the technology, that's the quality 4.0, is also about the humanity. So when people start talking about quality 4.0, it's actually part industrialization, the systems component, and also part the humanity. Okay. Uh, he, he, uh, he went on and mentioned the 6D of Peter Demandius. Uh, digitized, deceptive, disruptive, demonetized, dematerialized, and democratized world. Okay. Just a couple comments here. All right. Okay. Uh, here's another no question. Here's one from okay. Matthew. Okay. Here's from Matthew. Uh, theory of profound knowledge global would be very useful in developing vaccines for the global community, but we suboptimize the profound knowledge within the firm for its profit first. How do we reach the global theory of profound knowledge state? Well, it's interesting. I mean, if you use vaccine as, as an example, I think it, it's very interesting because patent law, copyright law is where the pharma companies take their money. You know, they get 17 years of, of preservation of revenue, and so they get their fee, their payback for their R&D usually in the first year or so. And then that's what makes them exceptionally profitable. However, one of the questions is, if, if you're getting money from governments for developing something, should the patent be for private sector or should it be available for all? And I think this is the question with the vaccines now. So, so I mean, the, the government is now talking about maybe we should uh, make public patents, and the government has lots of precedents for doing this. Anytime that there has been a monopolistic state of an organization, their patents have been uh, put into public domain. This happened to Xerox in 1975 when they owned all patents for xerography, and the government said, you're a monopoly, and 2,500 patents are now in public domain, and that opened up competition to every other company to make copiers. And, and so we see this is a right of government. All of those are claims are issued as a right or a privilege of government to individual corporations. And the question is, who benefits? Should it be society at large or a private company? And I think that I've already answered that question then by so this, this comment. Okay. Um, another question from Maria. She says, looking for a global system architecture, uh, how we improve the biosphere when we're moving more and more into virtual environments, where it may take us away from local and global needs and potentially creates an out-of-touch society. Well, the biosphere is where we live and breathe, and we're never out of touch with it because we're dead if we are. Um, and, and we're actually fermenting the ground. So, uh, I mean, I don't understand this out of touch. The biosphere itself is everything about life and what sustains life. And that includes the humans and the actions that we take. And so in that, that broad definition of biosphere, it includes the oceans, it includes the atmosphere, and it includes the land and all that is on it. So the biosphere is that living engagement that creates life on planet Earth. And that is as collective as you can get. Now, if we choose technologies that isolate us, that means we isolate individuals, but that doesn't necessarily mean we've isolated the biosphere. Okay. So here, here's another one from, uh, okay, here's one from Ricardo. He says, given the degree of development of a country, if we want all humanity to equally enjoy welfare, wouldn't, wouldn't it be needed that the most developed countries help the others in order to be at the same level and start the journey together? Well, I don't think they can start the journey, but I think they can continue the journey together. And yes, there does need to be collaboration and sharing in the world to make it happen. Okay. Um, 
and and here's one just right away from from Austin. Uh, while quality for humanity has distinctly apolitical goals, I cannot help feel that the exclusively political worldviews will try to essentially corrupt this vision in its application. How do we prevent that from happening? Well, I agree with Austin uh, that that politics always tries to work things to the advantage of some um, uh, interest. That's what politics does. That's why we call talked about you know quality as a, as, as a uh, in, in terms of politics before in a previous lecture. And and the problem that we have is that somebody has to be this objective third party that is able to call both sides out. And, and I think this is, you know, it, it, if you take a look at what the judicial system is supposed to do, if you don't game the judicial system, but, but that is also kind of what the role of quality is. So when I was in Compact Computer, for instance, I was the customer advocate. So I would go and tell the organization it was doing wrong on behalf of the customers when the customers didn't know. But I was there as their voice and their eyes on the, the pulse of the organization. And when we were doing things that short-circuited the, the desires of the customer or did things that would not benefit the customer, that was the role of the quality function. Okay. Um. So, all right then, I'm, I'm going to uh, kind of take us sort of towards the end here. I want to remind everybody that uh, if for some reason you have a question that occurs to you after, you may send an email to Dr. Watson, greg at excellence.fi. Uh, um, and we're, we're getting a lot of thank yous in, in, the, in the chat window. Um, I'd also like to, and, and I note that you, you have a YouTube channel here, and I believe all of your presentations will be there, correct? Uh, no, they're, they're actually on my, my website already there. The Gregory oh, okay. EU has the website that's got my Udemy courses and also 25 electronic books that I've written and I have used for my clients. They're now there uh, going all the way back to 1980 and 15 of my most popular articles. The YouTube website okay. is going to have speeches that are not on my uh, website. Ah. So that's, that's what that is. Okay, be. okay, good. So, so if you want to know more about this, you may go to uh, gregoryhwatson.eu. All right. Um, so uh, you're also running a series of managing for efficiency webinars coming up, right? Yes. And uh, so the first two have been uh, delivered uh, already. They will be on the YouTube channel for the Lean Enterprise Division. And then there's one a month for the next four months. And this leads okay. up to something that QMD people will be interested in, designing an executive quality management system for daily management, which is what this focus is, then blended in with what we've done uh, in these lectures for uh, Hoshin Connery or the executive uh, management system or the operational system. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we will uh, want to just uh, do a